Next.js 15 is out. And the good news is if you're learning Next.js, there are no big changes. So server components, server actions, really the fundamental things, they all work the same. But there are some smaller changes that I think is still important to know about. So I'll quickly list out the most important things that you need to be aware of. So here I have a Next.js 15 app. This is the homepage. If we take a look, you'll see it's very similar as before. It's almost the exact same. I just have my server components here and some markup, just like what we're used to. But there is actually already one change, which is if I go to my package.json, you can see I added this dash dash turbo flag here to next dev. If I open up my terminal, you can see this app is running with what's called turbo pack. Basically, I can still run it as before npm run dev, right? Just like before, but since I added this turbo flag here, it's going to be using turbo pack to bundle basically combine all these import statements with turbo pack instead of webpack. What's the benefit of turbo pack? Well, during development in the, ne the next JST mentioned that it's simply much faster, right? So when you start the dev server, it's going to be much faster. Uh, when you make a change and you save, it's going to recompile. Uh, it's gonna be much faster. When you go to a new route, it's gonna compile much faster. So basically your developer experience should be much faster with Turbo Pack. By the way, what is that actually a bundler? Well, when I go to the homepage here, I'm using an import here, right? So this link component is coming from another file. So to get this route ready for me, this home route, it needs to combine all these imports together. And I may have other components here, like some feedback form right, from another file. It needs to combine all the import statements. And that's what a bundler does. And actually by default in JavaScript itself, we can already do this. So you already have ESM modules. When you run that in the browser, the, the browser can compile all of that together, but the browser will do it for all the routes. So for your whole app essentially, whereas a bundler like TurboPack can do it for the route that you are just visiting. So for the home route, if I go, if I refresh here you can see it's just compiling the home route and not anything else so that's much faster if i go to the slash posts route you can see it's it says compiled slash posts and not any other route so a bundler can do it essentially on demand as you visit a particular route which is going to be faster all right so next thing is i'm on the slash posts here if i go to an individual posts page here you can see i have a param here in the url this is the id of the post and this page displays the title and the body of that post I'm using some dummy API. If I go to my folder here, you can see this is like before, that's a dynamic route. And I have one page here for all the possible IDs. So based on what's in the URL, right, based on this param here, I wanna fetch the right data. So I need to know what's in the URL. We can use the params prop for that. And the new thing here is that it's now a promise. So basically before we could do params.id, right? You need to use the name that you specify within the square brackets, that's ID. It's a promise, it's asynchronous. So first you need to await the params and then you can get the ID. Right. And then based on that, I can make a fetch call to some dummy API here with that ID. What did I do here? I'm just taking that post and displaying the title and body. The same is true for search params. So if you have uh, search params, if you're using that, right, so that's when you have, for example, uh, something like this in the URL, some key value pair with a question mark. That's a search param. That's also asynchronous now. So you need to await that first. By the way, you only get these props in a page server component, right? So you don't get these in some other server component. So only in pages. If you use cookies, or headers, they are also asynchronous now, right? So if you use them somewhere in the server action or route handler, you need to await those as well. So what else has changed? Well, the caching is less aggressive now. So if I open up my network tab here, when I go to slash posts, view all posts, you can see it has loading dot dot dot. And for that loading, I'm just using that loading convention that was already there. And you can see it fired off a network request to get that particular posts page, right? Which pasted page is just a React server component, right? The post page is this one I have right here. That's this page component. I'm just making a fetch call to get the posts and then I'm just listing their titles here. But it's just a React server component. So when you navigate, it will just essentially fetch a React server component and then swap it out. That's essentially how we're navigating here. You're not going to get a completely new HTML file when you navigate. It's a soft navigation, you could say. It's just going to swap out some React server component. So when I click on the first one here, you'll see loading dot 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 and it's getting some other React server components, right? That's that, right? which is this page server component, this one, okay? Now, before what happened is if I now do it all over again, if I now go to slash posts again, we would not see loading dot 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 because previously it was cached, but now you can see it's firing off a new network request again. And also when I click on the first one, you can see it's, it's just gonna make another fetch call to get that server component. So by default, that uh, client side router cache is not caching these pages. So whenever you go to a page, it will always get the latest 
uh, page essentially which is uh, useful for apps where you have a lot of data that changes and you don't want to have any client side uh, router cache but for a, an app like this how often are these posts really going to change not not very often so we should probably be pretty aggressive with caching so how can we get caching here well we can go to next config here here we can use experimental how do i know that by the way well i have autocomplete here I can use option escape on my Mac. It's going to be similar on Windows. And I get all these options because now this config file is also nicely typed. So we can get autocomplete here. One of the things we can use here is experimental and then stale time. So here we could say if it's a dynamic route, it should be cached for 30 seconds. And if it's a static route, it should be cached for three minutes. If I do this now, and now if I go back to my homepage here, when I go to slash posts now, you can see initially it has to get the actual React server components, right? And if I click on the first post here, it well, the first time we go there, it will have to get it. But now if we try going there again, right, homepage here, but now if I go to slash posts again, you can see it's not making a new fetch call because it's just reusing it from that client side cache. It has put that RSC payload in a client side cache. So when I click on the first post here, for example, you can see it's just reusing that from the previous time we made that request, right? That's the client side cache also includes the back and forward buttons, which still is cached by default, by the way. So the you you will still get instant back and forward buttons uh, because that that is still cached regardless of what you do here. Now we're talking about caching. I know it's a complex topic. So if you're a little bit confused, I think that's totally normal. I will have a separate video on this very soon as well. So what we, what we just discussed is the client side router cache, basically a cache that lives in the browser but here on the server side we are making a fetch call as well and by default previously if you're using the fetch api like this in a server component it would store the result of that in a so-called data cache a server-side data cache actually a very powerful cache because it also persists across deployments on for sale for example so pretty powerful cache and by default that was enabled but now these fetch calls are not cached anymore so whenever this component is rendering it will make a new it will actually make a new fetch call in this case to this server I'm using, which could potentially be pretty expensive, especially during development when I change something here. Right, if I make a change here and now if I save this, uh, you can see it's compiling again. Whenever you make a change, it may re-render this. And so during development, you would make a lot of network calls and that could potentially be very expensive if you're using some third-party server. So that's why they have an improvement here. So during development, server components are re-executed when saved. So if you have a fetch call to an API endpoint, they are also called. Now to improve that local development experience and reduce potential costs, during development, hot module replacement is reusing the fetch responses so to, essentially during development it's still cached essentially that's how you that's how you can think about it i think but during production this is not going to be cached so in production if somebody goes to slash posts it would uh, and this renders it would make the fetch call again which is kind of wasteful because how often are these posts really going to change not that often so we probably want to be pretty aggressive with caching here so you can provide a second parameter here and by default now it's no store so that is the default now but if we want to cache this i can say force cache to opt into the data cache should it be cached forever no we can say after 10 minutes let's say when there's a new request we do want to reach out to that api endpoint again right so we can specify the caching like this caching is super complex so totally normal if you're confused something else that you may have noticed is that we have this little thing in the corner now and it's going to tell you whether the route that you're on, so in this case the home route, is statically or dynamically rendered. So here it's telling me it's the static route. So what that means is that the HTML for this route, basically uh, this page here, so all of this markup here, it's going to take all of this together, all the imports, and it's just going to generate HTML out of this. So then when somebody goes to the home page, we don't have to run anything in this component again because the HTML is already there. So that's faster. That's what we want if, if it's possible. However, some routes, so for example, here for the individual posts here, where we have essentially the uh, square brackets here, well, we could technically have an infinite amount of IDs here. So during the builds, Next.js cannot generate an infinite amount of pages. It doesn't know all the possible IDs that could be used, right? So, so for that page, it will not generate HTML out of the box. So this route will be dynamically rendered. Previously, if you wanted to know that, well, what you had to do is you had to run a build. So you would do npm run build. So you had to wait, you had to wait, and only when it's finished, you could see if it was dynamically or statically rendered. And actually, this is quite cumbersome because you can see the build will also fail sometimes. By default, if you don't have your types right, the build will actually fail. So here I haven't typed post here. Uh, so let me actually add this post type here. And now I have to run a build again. So when this is finished, I will get some output here. You can see here that the homepage is uh, statically rendered, right? So we can already generate HTML during the build. But 
But for all of those individual posts, this is server rendered on demand. This is a dynamically rendered route. We could already get the information before, but you had to run a build, which is quite cumbersome because as we could just see, the build is gonna fail very often um, or it could take a long time. So with this widget here, we don't have to wait for that. We can just immediately see it when we go to that route. So it has a real value add. Now, unfortunately, at the time of recording, it seems to be a little bit buggy, right? For, for example, when I go to this page here for this route, it's telling me it's a static route. Whereas with the build output here, it's telling me it's dynamically rendered. So it seems to be a little bit buggy and there are some issues on uh, on the GitHub, on the Next.js GitHub repo about this. I think it's a pretty easy fix, but uh, it has a real value add in that we don't have to run a build to figure it out, right? If you don't like it, you can also just close it. There is also actually a new component in Next.js. There were already some components, right? Link from Next. We also have the image component. And basically what Next.js does with these things is, is it just helps you out with some of the common functionalities that you want. So you can just use those components and they take care of them. Yes. And that is also true for the new form component. So here I can use form and actually my auto import doesn't work yet, but I can import it manually like this, right from next form. What do we get? Well, we just get a simple form here, right? Just like, well, what you would expect actually. So I just have an input, right? I just have an input here and a button, right? Because let's say um, instead of on this route, I'm listing all the posts here or or like 10 posts, but maybe the user can search for posts, maybe with a word that should be in the title or something like that. Well, why is this beneficial? Well, if I search for, let's say, I wanna see all the posts with the word food in the title. If I click on search posts, you can see it automatically adds it to the URL as a search param. So it takes the name of the input, which is query, sets it to the input of the, to the value of the input, and it automatically navigates to that Page. So I don't have to attach that to the URL all by myself. It does it automatically for me. With the action attribute here, I can just specify slash posts and everything else will be added as a search per RAM. So then based on what's in the URL, I can go to this post now, right? So then I can go to slash posts, right? Here previously, we were still getting uh, all of the posts, right? But now we can take a look at what's in the URL, right? So now in this case, we're gonna use search params and I can type it as follows. Remember it's asynchronous now. So if I wanna see the query that the user typed, I have to first await it and then I can do dot query, right? That's the name of the search param here. And then based on that, I can actually use that uh, third party API like this. So you can do title like, and then whatever was in that query. So let me try that out. So actually we already see no posts. There's there's because it's in Latin language, so there are no posts with food in their title. But if I do something like add and search post, you can see it finds three posts based on the, that have add in the title. You can see it as a bit of a utility function. With this form component, we can add a string for the action attribute or a server action. I'll show you that in a second as well. If you provide a string like what we did here, it will add it as a search param and then navigate to there, saving you a bunch of boilerplate if you, would do it, if you had to do it yourself. This is probably the the most beneficial example of using the form component where the goal of the form is to essentially navigate right here i'm just navigating so then this page can take care of it which is very common for a search type of form but in practice we often have forms for submitting data in that case we may have a server action and i can import it here and I can still specify a server action for this as well. I have that here in a file with use server at the top. This is essentially a post API endpoint. So what Next.js will do is it will take the data of this form. Right now, let's say it's submit feedback and the name of the input should be uh, content, let's say. Next.js will now take the data of the form and submit it to my server side here. I'm gonna get it as form data, bit of a tricky data structure. So I'm gonna convert it here to normal JavaScript object. And let's actually log this and see what we get if I, if I submit this now. If I say test, submit feedback, you can see I'm getting data object here with content test. And importantly, it resets the form. So this automatically uh, resets the form with a server action. About these server actions, by the way, if I try doing this again, test two, if I click here, you can see this with a server action, there is still a fetch call to your server. Next.js does it for you automatically. You can see it's actually a post to the URL on which you're using the server action. So this is on the homepage. So you're essentially creating a post API endpoint at the location, at the URL of where you're using the server action. So because of that, we need to be a little bit mindful of the security because technically somebody could just make a post call to this URL and perhaps trigger this function that runs on our server. So we want to be careful with that. So they made an improvement in Next.js 15 
for that as well. So to improve security, they have now dead code elimination. So basically, um, if you have a server action, and they give an example here, if you don't use this anywhere else, it will not create th that public endpoint. So it will just remove it during the build. That's one improvement. And if you do use it, they have now a secure ID, which makes it harder to guess essentially uh, on how to trigger the server action. But they mention you should still treat server actions as public HTTP endpoints. So you still need to secure them just like any API endpoint. We cannot just trust that what we're getting here is actually of the form data shape that we expect it to be. It could be somebody else trying to trigger this function. So we need to, we need to do proper validation and authentication and so on. We talk about this in my course as well. I highly recommend you go through my React and Next.js course if you really want to master all this Next.js app router stuff and React as well, actually. So there is something else that we can do in the config here in experimental, which is we can set the React compiler to true and, and it will use the React compiler in that case. So if you take a look at the package.json, you can see as of recording, this Next.js version is using the react 19 release candidate version so it's not completely stable yet and what react 19 brings is the react compiler it's still experimental in react but the main benefit of it will be that it can do automatic optimizations for you so that means at some point we will not need to use use memo anymore so in one of the projects in the uh, react and xjs course we have a list of items here and we want to display it in a sorted manner so here we're going to take those items and we're going to sort we're going to sort them. Now this is a pretty expensive computation. It's it's not something we want to do if we can avoid it. So you can avoid running this over and over again by using use memo. In that case, it will only do it if the items themselves change or if the sorting method changes. If there is any other reason why this component is re-rendering, it will not run that calculation again. That's the value of use memo. But with React Compiler at some point, the idea is that we can we don't have to use use memo anymore. It can automatically do it for us. And the same with use callback. So by default in a React component, if you define a function, it's going to recreate that every time it re-renders. With use callback, you can prevent that. So the main optimization APIs like use memo, use callback, and there's also react.memo. You, you can wrap a React component in this and it will prevent the re-rendering of the component if the props are the same, often used in conjunction with these two. At some point, the idea is that we don't have to do this manually ourselves. It's the React compiler that can do it automatically for us. But we're not completely there yet. So for now, I would still use these. And this has some other performance issues right now during development as well. So as of recording, it's not completely there yet. So I would still use, so I would still use these uh, APIs. But it's good to know that uh, pretty soon, hopefully, that is taken care of for us. Previously, if you were creating a .env file, it was not by default ignored but now you can see it is actually properly ignored by git ignore and the reason for that is that next.js also has their own .env.local convention however in many tools for example prisma prisma expects there to be a .env file so often people were also creating this .env file and so now with next.js 15 this is also uh, considered if you have to do something on the server in the server component or server action or route handler that is not really necessary for the response but you still want to do it for, for for example logging so we can sort of schedule it to run afterwards so that we can already return a response now and then we can worry about logging that so it won't affect the request response cycle if you want to self-host next.js previously they recommended that for the next.js image component to install the sharp package but with next.js 15 you don't have to do that anymore so if you want to master react and next.js I highly recommend you go through my react and next.js course in which we build some beautiful projects from scratch step by step so you can see how everything fits together. We start at a very beginner level, and by the end, we're building some cutting edge Next.js applications. So highly recommend that you check that out. You can find a link in the description. I'm Wesley, by the way, I'm a brand ambassador for Kind, which is a paid sponsorship. Check them out for authentication. I had a great time working with them as well. And there are many other improvements here that we could talk about, but these were the most important ones, I would say. I personally will probably stick to Next.js 14 for some time, um, and then I will probably upgrade at some point. In any case, Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.